Hello, everyone. My guest today is Adam Hildreth. He's one of the foremost global experts on how to keep people safe from the dangers resulting from user-generated content posted online. He's worked with global brands, governments, and law enforcement for the past 12 years on issues including child grooming, security threats, and reputational issues. Adam, are you ready to take us to the top? I am indeed, yeah. Okay, good. So tell us first, I mean, kind of what the company does, and is this a B2C play or a B2B play? Are moms buying this to protect their kids or are businesses protecting this to protect from, you know, foreign hackers? So we're a sole B2B play, uh, generally dealing with large enterprise global blue chip companies, um, helping them manage the risks of user-generated content on social media. So everything from people posting offensive content on their Facebook pages um, to social PR crisis, to threats to their executives and staff. Okay, and so let's go with the first example you gave, which are you know posts, images posted on Facebook. Facebook has enough issue trying to figure out what's you know a you know not an appropriate picture on Facebook or not. I mean, how do you help them, or or how, who do you work with at Facebook to help figure that out? So we've spent twelve years developing some very sophisticated AI that understands a brand's nuanced requirements around images, text, posts, video. Um, and the, the thing that's unique about our service um, versus anything else that's out there is we actually apply a, a human wrapper. Um, so that so AI does all the heavy lifting for ninety nine percent of the content, and sometimes we just verify it with a human to make sure that AI isn't making those mistakes. And of mm -hmm. course, AI learns from that feedback loop as well. Can you give me a specific example? Actually, name a company you're working with and tell me how they're using you. Yeah, sure. So we work with Coca Cola, we work with Disney, we work with Chanel. So again, large global brands. Okay, so that's big one. Go deep on Coca Cola. So Coca-Cola, we help them manage um, all of their own social media channels. So they do a lot of outbound marketing, a lot of outbound communication with their consumers um, through those channels. They receive a huge amount of inbound user-generated content. All of that content flows through our services in real time, is checked to make sure it's appropriate for the brand, for their audience, um, and that it well, follows... What, so what if it's not? What if Joanne131 on Twitter tweets her holding a Coca-Cola beverage to the Coca-Cola Twitter account and you deem it not an appropriate message? Who cares? Like, what do you do about that? So Twitter's slightly different in that we can't remove things on Twitter. All we'd be doing is making sure that that wouldn't be used in any brand communications. Um, where you'd probably be is a good example is a brand's own Facebook page. So a brand will put out their terms of service to say what's acceptable and what isn't. And if it falls out of those acceptable criteria, then it would be moderated and removed. That's um, only if they're posting technology. on the page versus if I post a status on my profile. It, exactly. And then the other side of our business is a monitoring side of a business where we can actually, we would potentially be alerting their PR and their digital teams to a risk that was happening um, and just keeping them in the loop. But we do that 24 hours a day, 365 within minutes. And our job is to get someone out of bed at three in the morning if a crisis is happening on social media. Okay, yeah. So, you, uh, sorry, I, I had the assumption you, you were kind of like a security firm. You're not a security firm. You're more of like a, a, a uh, an analytics and AI-driven kind of social media analytics software, where, you know, response to, responding to threats. Yeah, so we're more dealing with, we still consider ourselves in the risk protection space, but more from a marketing risk protection yeah. rather than a security risk protection space. So, so the CMO is buying us to making sure that their, their brand reputation, their brand image is maintained. And if there is something happening, if, if something's trending that's mentioning their brand or a celebrity they work with, they need to know about that. You know, the sooner that they're forewarned about it, the sooner they can do something about it. Yeah. Tell me about what, you know, I don't want to go down every customer cohort, but on average, what's a customer paying you per month or per year for this sort of service? Um, it, it varies dependingly on everyone. It, it's thousands of months at the starting point. Um, and that can move up as they take different services in different languages. Okay. But, but generally speaking, you said five, you, said, you cut out, you said 5,000 a month. It's thousands a month that we charge and it very, it depends on customer to customer. Okay. Got it. Yeah. I mean, again, that's why I try and get in on an average. Are you generally though going after mid-market or enterprise? No, enterprise is pretty much our entire customer base is large global enterprises. Okay. So every ACV is, I mean, are, are most of them pushing or north of six figures? Uh, yes. Okay. That's majority. Okay, great. All right. Give me more of the backstory here. When did you launch the company? So the company has been going for 12 years. Um, the background was I ran one of the first virtual worlds and social networks Back in, we founded that in 2000, 2001. There's a company called Dubit. Um, we employed more 
human moderators that were doing this job to make sure that our social network was safe for advertising than anything else. So I left that company um, in 2005 to found Crisp so we could focus 100% on developing technology that could do all the heavy lifting and analysis rather than people. Got it. Okay, so that was 2006. And did you bootstrap the company or have you raised? We bootstrapped and then we did high net worth individuals. And today we are essentially profitable, um, okay. albeit that we push all profits back into the growth as you'd expect. Yeah, you're operating at break even. Yeah. How, how much total have you raised? Uh, we did in the region of 7 million UK. Okay, got it. And, and again, were, were those both, was that a note from individuals or did you ever do an equity round, a Series A? Um, we didn't do a formal equity round. We did high net worth funding and angel type funding. Okay, got it. But again, debt, convertible debt or equity? No, all equity. All equity. Okay, great. That's good. It's, it's interesting to me. When, by the way, when was that last round? You said it was 08? Oh, four years ago was our last round. Okay. So you don't really have your pulse in terms of the funding, you know, the current state of funding in London and Europe? Uh, we do because there's a ton of people that are engaged with us all the time. And it seems to be on the up, to be honest, from our perspective. We're not, you know, that's not so we're actively engaged in, but it sounds good. I know we can't put anything in terms of writing in there in terms of where we are, but yeah, it sounds good. And, and walk me through scale you're at today. So how many customers have you scaled to? So we work for thousands of brands um, across the world. Um, we probably have in the region of 100 core billing customers and then work throughout all of their global organization. Um, Business-wise, we are 75, 80 core people. Um, R&D headquartered in Leeds in the UK, sales teams in London, New York, San Francisco. Okay, got it. So, so UK, US, <clears throat> kind of remote, 75 people. You said 100 kind of build customers, but they represent many, many more brands worldwide. Is that accurate? That's correct, yeah. Okay. And then, I mean, we can generally, if, if each of you said earlier, your ACVs are north of six figures, each of them. I mean, can I take, you know, a six figure called a hundred grand ACV times a hundred build customers and assume you're north of 800 grand per month right now in MRR? Uh, you could assume that definitely. Okay. I mean, the, the, are those numbers generally, are, are you way above that? Am I way underestimating? Yeah, we, we'll be above 10 million. Oh, that's great. Uh, you'll, you'll and annualized. That yeah. You're past that already or you'll pass it this year? We're already past that. Oh, you're already past that. Good. Well, yeah, just, just, and just to be clear, 800 grand per month is, is 10 million annually. Yeah, absolutely. And we've yep. passed that. What, what do you think you'll grow to? I mean, how aggressively are you growing? Where were you 12 months ago? Um, so we're growing at circa 70% year on year. We expect to be growing further than that going into the hundred percent plus from okay. this point forward. So about a year ago, you were doing what call it 6 million in ARR? Yeah, circa that. Yep. And then, and then you think you'll, you'll be able to get up to call it 17 ish by the end of this year. We will be, yeah. Where's most of that growth coming from? Um, all direct sales at the moment. So going out, winning new brand customers. I mean, this space is absolutely on fire. If anyone looking at social media, how toxic and illegal content is being dealt with, how they're managing the content that's there, um, the space is absolutely huge. We, we've spent 12 years educating the market. Now sort of the media has done that education for us. So it's, it's inbound. Everyone's on top of this. Yep. Um, but in terms of like actual revenue growth, would you say it's more coming from expansion revenue across your current customer base or bringing on net new customers? Uh, both. So a mixture of both. Okay. No, there's no, there's no one core strategy you're driving harder. Oh, hang on. sorry. Two seconds. No. Can you repeat that? Yeah, Adam, there's no one core that you're driving harder. No, absolutely. It's both equal. Okay, great. And then of the 75 people, uh, you, I, you were breaking down R&D, but how many of them are salespeople? Um, oh, a, a handful, even less than that. So we are now in a big sales and marketing expansion exercise. So you have like five so far and you're, you're piling yep. more? Absolutely. So everything else was in engineering and support side. Okay. Churn is critical in a business like this. Talk to me about your churn. Um, tiny, very, very tiny amount of churn. Okay. Are you talking gross? Are you talking lo logo churn or revenue churn or both or what? Um, logo churn is tiny. And then actually our, in terms of net net churn with regards to upsells and everything else, it's positive. Okay. So if I asked you a different question, which is annually your, your kind of net revenue retention, it sounds like it's over a hundred percent. How far over a hundred percent? Let's say 110%. Okay. So that's pretty healthy. That's good. So your, your expansion revenue, uh, more than makes up by basically, you know, 10 points, your, your, any gross kind of revenue you lost. That's correct. Yeah. And, and when people do cancel your service, why typically are they canceling or downgrading? 
So generally speaking, when we look at churn, it's because they've done singular campaigns or UGC-based campaigns um, where we haven't necessarily rolled it out globally for the brand in question. Got it. All right, last few economics questions here before we wrap up with the famous five. A CAC, what are you willing to spend to acquire one of these six-figure first-year ACB customers? Uh, we don't give out that information at the moment. Okay, well, let me ask it differently. I mean, how aggressive are you being with payback period? How quickly do you like to get paid back? Oh, a year. A year. Okay, good. So if it's a hundred, you know, if it's a six figure ACV, yeah. you're totally comfortable spending first year ACV on acquisition. Uh, yeah, but it's a lot less than that at the moment. Okay. So, so you're way south of a 12 month payback period. Wait, co correct. Yeah. That's our maximum period that we'd have. Yeah. Got it. And, um, in, in, in articulate kind of the market conditions that would make you say, I'll be more aggressive with payback. In other words, you'll be more patient in terms of getting paid back versus getting it down to one month. Um, what market conditions would judge that? Um, I don't know because we haven't really had that trouble to be honest. You know, this is a, this is a market that's pretty self-explanatory. It works well and we, we charge, you know, it's, it's a high end ticket that's there. So mm -hmm. I'm not sure what would really affect that from our perspective. Well, if you, if you wanted to beat out some of your other competitors in terms of acquisition and you, and you're happy and you can afford to wait longer to get paid back, you might be able to grow faster. For example, that, that might be one condition. Yeah, sure. I think it would be more on actual expansion capital into our business. So more sales heads that we'd actually be adding on versus what we'd be doing with regards to the payback time. Um, for that, it'd be more the overall headcount that we'd be increasing. Well, just to be clear, payback period is, is a fully diluted metric. So you would include payback and sal you'd include salaries of, of salespeople in that metric. We would, yeah, but we'd be we'd also be expecting to be increasing on the same level, if that makes sense. Sure, so we but didn't, I wouldn't see that actually being affected. It will, it would though. I mean, it, unless you're saying people ramp up to quota immediately, uh, usually there's a, a pro forma you put together. You have six month ramp up period or something like that, right? We do. We have a six month ramp up period. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Oh. Sorry. I'm just going to ask. Anyway, around here. So Adam, wrapping up here with the, the last economics question, then we'll, then we'll end the interview. Talk to me about lifetime value. It can be dangerous because it can get really big very quickly, but what do you assume lifetime value is minimum? Um, we don't have that number at the moment that we would be prepared to to give that. Okay, it's just not something you use to guide you. Um, we don't at the moment because our churn is so low and it's annualized and they're recurring and it's not a product that tends to leave it. So it's a, it's a, it would be a bad number for us to, to be looking at. Yeah. All right. Very good. Let's wrap up here with the famous five. Number one, what's your favorite business book? Um, I don't have one. I don't read those books. Okay. Number two, is there a CEO you're following or studying right now? Absolutely. All over Zuckerberg. Okay. Number three, what's your favorite online tool for building the business? Um, all Google sheets, anything to do with that, that we can track KPIs. And uh, number four, how many hours of sleep do you get every night? Eight. And what's your situation? Married, single, you have kids? Um, I've got a partner and we've got three kids. Okay. Three kiddos. Good. And how old are you? I'm 33. And last question, what do you wish your 20 year old self knew? Um, that to pick the right people around you and trust them to run the business. Guys, there you have it. Pick the right people around you. He's helping folks, brand, large brands manage social media, especially when things start trending or there's risks associated with user-generated content. $7 million raised, team of 75 people based between the UK, US, and other remote locations, serving over 100 paying customers. First year ACB is north of six figures. So 6 million in ARR about a year ago, now up to 10 million, hoping to go about above 17 million by the end of the year this year. 110% net revenue retention annually. Thank you so much for taking us to the top, Adam. Appreciate it.